Good evening. Welcome to Penn Center. Thank you for attending this event, Sacred Spaces, the Penn Center Belief in Belonging. This panel is one of the many public programming events that are a part of culture and community at the Penn Center National Historic Landmark District, which represents the partnership between the Penn Center and the Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts at the University of Georgia, funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation. In addition to our spring conversation panels, our public programming events include an artist in residence program and summer research residencies, both of which allow its participants to tangibly engage with history, community, and culture here at Penn Center. We have an evening of wonderful events lined up for you to enjoy. After the panel, dinner will be served here. Following dinner, I invite you to join us at the Chapel of Ease for a special presentation by Charmaine Manyfield, who is presenting her projection installation entitled, The Praise House Project, Remembrance as Resistance, Preserving Black Narratives. At this time, please join me in welcoming my colleague, Dr. Barbara McCaskill, Associate Academic Director at the Wilson Center and Co-Project Director of Culture and Community at Penn Center. Thank you, Angela. And I would like to say, I can't say it enough, that Ms. Angela Dorr has done a fantastic yes. and phenomenal <laughs> job. So I'm going to introduce our moderator, Dr. Valerie Babb. Valerie Babb is Andrew Mellon Professor of Humanities at Emory University where she teaches in the departments of African American Studies and English. Her publications include A History of the African American Novel by Cambridge University Press. The book examines, among other topics, early black print culture, African American graphic novels, black pulp fiction, and the history of adaptation of black novels to film. Other books by Dr. Babb include Whiteness Visible, The Meaning of Whiteness in American Literature and Culture, written to shed light on the costs of white supremacy to the United States, and Ernest Gaines, a cultural study of the writings of the National Medal of Arts winner. She also co-authored Black Georgetown Remembered, a tribute to the little-known history of the Georgetown, Washington, D.C. black community and its struggle to hold on to property and community. And she developed the concept for and produced the documentary video by the same name. She is currently working on two book projects. The first, The Book of James, is under contract with Hatchet Press and uses the internationally known athlete to study and that's LeBron James, by the way, <laughs> to study anti-blackness in the United States and abroad. The second book is Who Ain't a Slave? How the American Epic of Enslavement Shaped Notions of Belonging. And that is under contract with Cambridge University Press. Before arriving at Emory, Dr. Babb was director of the Institute for African American Studies at the University of Georgia where she became involved in efforts to create an institutional space for the study and archiving of the histories unfolding with the Baldwin Hall excavation of human remains believed to belong to the enslaved, as well as a plan for creating collaborations between the university and Athens, Georgia community to acknowledge the significances of this rich history. From 2000 to 2010, she was editor of the Langston Hughes Review. She has been a scholar in residence at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. And she is the recipient of a W.M. Keck Foundation Fellowship in American Studies. 
She has lectured extensively in the United States and abroad, and she presented a distinguished W.E.B. Du Bois lecture at Humboldt University, Berlin, Germany. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Valerie Beck. <laughs> Thank you very much, Barbara, and welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming out and joining us. Um, we call this a panel, but it's really a conversation. So after we speak together for a bit, we hope to hear your voices and your thoughts and ideas as well. Ah, this evening, I am so happy to be in the presence of these two remarkable women who I have known of for much of my life. Natalie Days is renowned as Ms. Natalie on Nick Jr.'s award-winning television program, Gullah Gullah Island. My son and I grew up on that show. Yes. I remember Wana, Rick, and a few others there. But Natalie has been a practicing, self-taught visual artist for most of her life. It has only been during the past decade that she has shared her visual artwork outside her studio. Her paintings and functional art arise from the oral tradition. Natalie explores the continuation of telling through the use of acrylic, oil, paper, wood, and ink. Her Color Green series explores the rich traditions of the African American and Gullah Geechee communities that nurture her own creativity as well as the process by which creative action shapes the communities themselves. With her husband of more than 30 years, Ron Days, she has also developed and presented programming that expanded the understanding and celebration of Gullah culture. Welcome, Natalie, and thank you for thank joining you. us. <laughs> Charmaine Minifield is rooted in womanist social theory and ancestral veneration. Her work draws from indigenous traditions throughout Africa and the diaspora, to explore African and African American history, memory, and ritual as an intentional pushback against erasure. Her creative practice is community-based as her research and resulting bodies of work often draw from public archives as she excavates the stories of African American women-led resistance, spirituality, and power. Ms. Minifield recently served as a Stuart A. Rose Library Artist in Residence at Emory University and through a collection with Flux Projects presented her work Remembrance as Resistance, Preserving Black Narratives in Atlanta's Historically Segregated Cemetery to honor the over 800 unmarked graves that were discovered in the African American burial grounds. And by the way, thank you for the <laughs> Indigo Prayers in the Carlos. Uh, many of me and my colleagues at Emory were very grateful for that sacred space. Ms. Mm, Minifield was recently awarded the prestigious National Endowment of the Arts Our, Our Town grant to present her Praise House project in three different locations in the metro Atlanta area to celebrate the African American history of those communities. She currently splits her time in residence between Atlanta and the Gambia, where she continues to study the origins of her cultural identity and indigenous traditions by tracing the ring shout. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. We have a third participant. <laughs> Well, you probably can't see, but we are hoping he will be able to make it. There are some personal challenges, but he is Griffin Lofston, the Chief Executive Officer of the nonprofit Sam's Memorial Community Economic Development, Inc., as well as manager of the nationally acclaimed Geechee Gullah Ring Shouters. So let's keep our fingers crossed that yes. Mr. Lofton will be able to join us a bit later. I would like to begin, we were talking informally about sacred spaces in our conversations. I would be, like to begin by asking each of you how you understand that notion of sacred space. Natalie, would you like to start? I think that the spaces that we um, are intentional in, where we are present in, where we acknowledge what's come before us, are sacred spaces. I think any place we set our foot and take our breath can become 
a sacred space. When I step into my studio, it is a sacred, sacred space. When we stepped up on the stage, it was a sacred space. Though this space that we're in now has been sacred for, for many, many, many years. And has a very personal connection for you as well. Oh, it does. <laughs> it does have a very personal connection for me. When I drove up, I'm remembering the very first time my husband and I went anywhere and he took me to this space. Mm -hmm. He stood in um, Butler and sang the St. Helena hymn to me in the empty room. Mm -hmm. Uh, the very first time I performed with him, historic programs, we stood right there um, wow. some 37, eight years ago. We stood right there the very first time. I got married across the street. Oh, so, wow. um, yeah. yes, <laughs> it's a very <laughs> safe space yeah. 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 for me. But I think our intention makes spaces sacred. Um, the recognition of those who come before us. Our memories, when I loved hearing you talk about that, mm -hmm. makes spaces sacred. Um, yeah. th as a sort of, that's the quickest thing I can say, I guess, mm -hmm. about sacred space. I, yeah. I'm very grateful for the mobility of sacred spaces, oh, yes. the fact that we can take them with us because um, so much of our sanity depends on yes. that. So much of our survival depends on that. Thank you. Charmaine, what do you think of when you... Um, oh, so much. Just sitting here with you both, you all, in this space. I want to hear my voice in this space. The acoustics are wonderful. Oh, my goodness. My <laughs> we, may, we may have to. Okay, so <laughs> my grandmother, Ivani Bracer, sounded like Mahalia Jackson wow. in our hometown. I'm from the Midwest. But we shouted in the Midwest. My great-grandmother's line, Fuquay, yes, came from these parts, I believe, and, and, and that's where the shouting came through. For me and my work, I preserve those hidden pockets within our identity as sacred spaces that held us together and forward, moved us forward as power that can be access, activated, and invoked. Still, you know, in us. We traveled through the Middle Passage, detached from anything we knew, and we held our own divin divinity within us through that and arrived in these parts and thought how similar it looked. I was just in the Gambia. It looks just like, you know, Senegambia area. And we created sanctity in peril and in, a, in spaces of oppression, but we somehow preserved our divinity and our humanity inside of it. And so our culture and identity is, that, is the secret for me for the mobility of, the of that sacred space that you're speaking of and With why we not why Well, so not, when yeah. I, I talk to students, and I talk to people a lot. And you I say, talk to students. And I talk to people a lot. And you talk to people a lot. Yes. I oh, do. my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The space. We're going to have to sing. We're going to sing. We'll find a song. Okay. Yeah. We'll find a song. But I tell children, it. I say, we brought everything we needed in our memory. We did. I say they packed us on those ships. We had nothing in our pockets. We had nothing in our hands. We could not grab anything, but everything we needed, we brought here, we brought here, here, and here. Yes. And with that, we built everything that we've given yes. to you. Yes. So when you said memory, I said, yes, memory is the thing. We brought the sacred yes. spaces that's in our goal. memory. Yes, yes. That's and the... passed it on. Yeah. Now, you both are concerned with that, passing on sacred spaces oh, yeah. to other generations. But I want to ask you, we are in some very, very challenging times mm. right now. Mm. Sometimes talking to that next generation, there is quite a gulf. And I'm wondering if passing on sacred spaces in 2022 looks, feels, might be different from, let's say, the way our mothers might have passed it on to us. There is a revolution happening of self-care, of um, Sankofa returning back to look forward, 
of globalized reality and living and recognizing ourselves and our identity and our, our indigenous selves. All people are doing that in the name of preserving this planet and climate justice. We are returning back to our indigenous practices. Um, but just as I talk to young people, rep your brand. You know, like Louis Vuitton, Gucci, those are family names. Right. You know what I'm saying? Where is yours? Right? Mm -hmm. Indigo. Indigo alone, just on the conversation of intellectual property, when you really claim the narratives, the black narratives within indigo, that's heavy mud cloth dyed in indigo. Heavy cotton dyed in indigo is denim jeans. Denim jeans. So a lot of this is just acknowledging the erasure that has happened and the, the acceptance that we all have you know, allowed for that erasure. And when you awaken that in a young person, this is, what time, this is where they are anyway. That's why we're having these discussions. We're having these moments because this generation, they do not want to see another turn of white supremacy. Yes, as, as I hear them say, they aren't here for the BS. They aren't here for it. And um, they are planting gardens. They are really, they're doing the old root work. They're doing the root work our ancestors did True. now. They're remembering the stories of their grandmothers. They That's are. what we, that, and they that are. is, and, and it's a medicine, it's a, it's a um, powerful, you know, uh, element to how we survived anyway. Yes. So in these, in the worst of times, we remembered ourselves. That was the ring shout. We stood in circle. We sang in call and response. We um, found harmony <laughs> among strangers often. We found harmony. We created community. We created a whole new technology when they took our drums. We spoke in, the, in these floors. And these floors we stomped on these floors. A technology yeah. that the, the, all of that, all of that, to me, point to the contemporary versions of that and claim our narratives within technology. Mm -hmm. To name the ring shot of technology is about reclaiming that place in centering blackness inside of the contemporary discourse where it's been erased. Right. It is a tool to be used then. Yes. To be Learned yes, to and, be to be passed on. On. and to be passed on, and to be and to be um, remembered at the moment of healing, because remembrance is the healing, mm -hmm. is the preservation that moves us forward. Remembering ourselves. Now, Natalie, you are a storyteller mm -hmm. in multiple forms. Korea. Yes, Korea. Um, what was that? Was there a transition between storytelling to art, or was it more fluid? And is it? A case where you can't see where one stops and the other begins? I would say perhaps the latter. Um, I'm still very much a traditional storyteller, and very mm -hmm. much narrative, and there's narrative in my work. And every painting that I do, there is story in it. There are the collard greens that my, grand, my father grew in the yard, and that my grandmother had a collard green plant that she picked off. It was a tree. Wow. She would just keep picking off from the bottom. A collard green tree. A collard green, green, green tree. And so um, when I began sharing my work, it was through the, the first recognition of the collard greens as, as heritage, as who's going to bring the greens, mm -hmm. as, as the family gathers mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. as that, that connecting thing that when you see the greens, that if you have an African-American gathering, Somebody's bringing a green. Yes. yes. And in my family, yes. ultimately, I became the bearer of greens. And now, actually, my daughter has passed me on the cooking of the greens, and I turn it over to her. Bless you. Um, this is good to know. <laughs> <laughs> She's good. So that was part of it. You know, I became a storyteller here in this space. Mm -hmm. That's when I knew. I didn't know. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how it happened? Uh, I was born in central New York. But uh, in 1983, when I was 22, um, it was decided by my extended family. And you know, when folks say you were born in New York, you're a New Yorker. No, we were all expats. I didn't know any black folk who weren't from the South. We were the first generation born there. And when my grandmother lived um, down the road, 
uh, was ill, and then I was having some personal challenges in my life. The family decided, I was not in on the conversation, that I would come. Mm -hmm. And so I did, and I met Ron, who I later married, who was writing his very first book, A Reminiscences of a Sea Island Heritage. Mm -hmm. He grew up down yes. the road. His as mama come, went to school As here. you come home. As I come home. His mama went to school here. His daddy went to school here. He grew up down the road. And the first book he wrote was Oral Histories of Folk He Knew. And one day, I was just joking. I said, we could be like Ruby D and Ozzy Davis. And he said, OK, here. <laughs> tell that story. Yes. Tell that. And yes. the first story, it was tell the story of the woman who had been the midwife on the islands. Um, I can't think of her name right now, but she delivered more than 300 babies right out here, 3,000 babies by foot, no car. And um, then he said, tell the story that people could fly, which was collected uh -huh. in Charleston. And I stepped onto that stage and into the story. And it was like stepping into myself. Yes. Mm -hmm. It yes. was like, mm -hmm. yes. oh, this yeah. is And you it. see that whatever barrier between self and the idea that, of a story. Just you channel a story. Memory. It's story. the memory. Right. The right. channel memory. the story. The first day I ever walked down by myself, I felt like I was being watched. And it honestly felt like folks said, well, where you been? Right. Mm -hmm. Where you been? Mm -hmm. right. Not mm -hmm. surveilled. Somebody, somebody no, remember. Watched. Watched. Yes. Not by yes. people you could see. Exactly. Yes, yes. Right. But it honestly was like, oh, what time yes. you got here? Yes, <laughs> yes. Right. familiar. Familiar. Yes. So I had been saying, you know, y'all sent me down south, and y'all can't keep me down there. <laughs> and then I called and said, Daddy, just pack my stuff. <laughs> Ship it down. You're here, you're home, right, you're home. Right. 39 years. 39 and, years. Uh, the place is very important yes, um, yes, in yes. this whole process that we're yes. talking about. That it was sacred space. It was holy. I knew it. Yeah. When you I were, knew it. You felt it mm -hmm. and knew it. Now, mm -hmm. now, you're occupying two spaces, yes. aren't you? You know my mind went to <laughs> home. Yeah. The Gambia. Mm -hmm. um, I was stranded in the Gambia for 14 months during quarantine. My flight was due back on March 16th. <laughs> The pandemic wow. broke out and I couldn't come home. I had my six-year-old then mm. and um, took a piece of my life savings and put it on a um, compound to rent because we didn't know how long it would, t we would, it would go on. Um, and it's been a minute. And, it's, and, and, and the borders didn't reopen for eight months. Mm -hmm. um, by that time, I had, I had to put a full year down. So I used the time as an artist in residence but all of that was just a divine opportunity to sit with my ancestors and receive those memories. Um, I used the time as an artist in residence with their guidance. Mm -hmm. And I sought out Indigo and the keepers of Indigo in those spaces. Um, I was guided into beautiful ceremonies and festivals. It was festival season I was there during. So I saw to, you know, these totemic images of uh, huge masquerades from each village parading in. Um, and all of that contributed to my work. And I, uh, in order to stay connected to my family and all of you, I did all of this on social media, live, mm -hmm. a lot of it. And um, I had painted a mural of Harriet Tubman in New, in New York on Harry Tubman Way. And um, before that, we had come to Penn Center Heritage Center, and, and I was painting Ella Baker on walls in Atlanta and all of these monuments of ancestors, and then went home. And I stood in slave port villages and at ports, you know, moments of return, yeah. and um, really sat inside of what my work calling and destiny and prayers were um, as all of this was happening to you all and with the world and uh, there was no pandemic there it was an endemic around january this past um, winter but nothing there so it was, i was in an oasis while all this is happening but you know it was sacred space of course and holding those histories and then i returned back to build the praise house with those histories you know, very present and on me. What is that return back like mm -hmm. after you've been in that space in Gambia to come to the space in Atlanta? You know, um, man, with, with the Gambia, I, we went to Gori Island in Senegal, 
and you saw this raging sea between the mainland and the coast, and you realized that that was the first point of brainwash. You're never making it back. Um, and to, but to make it back, you know, and then to come to the, this region and think these are islands off the coast too, and how did terrain play a role in, in uh, enslavement here? And um, all of that sort of contributes to what I'm thinking about in resistance today as the foundations for um, what I feel ails this country. <laughs> um, and that is, you know, the stain of white supremacy still. Um, and um, so living between here and Atlanta, Atlanta and the Gambia, the South, you know, where there's Confederate monuments um, and, um, you know, some, in some cases, polarized politics and things. In some cases. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> polarized politics. Um, and, and, you know, the real issues. There was the uprising last summer. Um, when, when George Floyd was murdered and I was in the Gambia, that's when I began to shout you know, in mourning. Um, and I did too, perhaps for different reasons. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It I, went through your full body. It does. It went through your full body. So it, it's been a jar to come back to this space after feeling freedom is how it felt. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Natalie, how does space interact with your work, or does it? Well, you know, the other pandemic was very different for me. Mm -hmm. I was in Georgetown, South Carolina, uh, and my space in some ways became very small, very specific. Um, I was caring for an elder. I was uh, mourning Everything. all of it. Um, we had just gotten back from um, Bunce Island in Sierra Leone before the pandemic closed us down. And the work that I intended to do, that I, didn't, I had no idea how my work would be impacted by that trip. Um, it was not as long as yours because but we got back. Times and yes. And so then all of a sudden, there we were, and I was in this. I was here, and I did not feel safe. I was in a community that was very red. I used to walk miles every day, and I began to stay home because I did not feel safe walking. And so the space that the work began it felt like a, it was a small bubble of safety. Sacred space. Of sacred space. And I began, it's funny, you talk about the, the, the uh, you talk about the masquerades. I began to do work with gourds and to try to sort of, I created what I call the Sacred Vessel Project mm. to deal with what it felt like to me. What, what, how do we contain, what do we put in a sacred vessel? How are we sacred when the world seems to close in on you? Mm. So um, I had to, like, like you said, to find this thing within myself. And then it did affect my work. So I began to do three-dimensional work um, through this, mm -hmm. using the things that were right there, that the gourds, you know, okra pods from my yard that were coming out of the heads, the pine cones from the end of the street, the um, field peas from my garden from that the earth. began mm -hmm. to be a part of the work that I was doing. It was a very different healing kind of work so that the, the actual dirt and the earth and my work became the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and in that process, somehow I manifested a studio, the garage shop. How, I don't know, because I was like, how am I going to get the money? Medicine, it just kind of happened, and then I had yeah. this other, so that the garage has now another sacred space. It's a chapel, it's a worship mm -hmm. space, that when I walk into the door, it's, and I light the candle, and I make my gratitude to all those who've come before, and I pick up the brush, or I pick up the tools, mm -hmm. and I make sacred objects. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of how it worked for me. Um, that is how I stayed sane and alive mm -hmm, mm -hmm. during this, this time. time. Yeah, this and time. then I went in the house and tried to keep other people alive. <laughs> right, right. But it was a much, it was small, but it was big. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it right. was the, the medicine element that came through yes. with that time mm -hmm. of solitude and centering. 
Yes, yeah, very, very much. And I, so I did some similar, similar to you in terms of online. I invited folk who are in my Patreon. To learn. 40 days of sacred, uh, uh, I called it uh, creativity as, as a spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. And for 40 days, at 6 a.m. and 8 p.m., I live streamed every day. You better go ahead and, and do that. we lit the candle, we acknowledged our ancestors in gratitude, and we did that for 40 days. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it, in that little piece of patch right. in Georgetown County, South Carolina, right. that was how it impacted and how space worked for me, from me being like, well, I'm everywhere, mm -hmm. off I go, to I am very <laughs> present here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everything I am touching for this project, most of it, I did not grow the gourds, but it so happened I had bought 30 gourds some year, a few years ago for a project, never did it, and they were there, and I put my hands on them. It was, what do I have? How can I use it? Mm -hmm. And as a friend of mine said, everything I need is right in front of me. Mm -hmm. And so that became mm -hmm. what's in front of me. <laughs> And how can I use what I have, which I think is a lesson also for my ancestors. Yes. What do we have that yes. we can use? Yes. And what can we make from it? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, so yes. That, Which is the story of Penn Center? I think so. <laughs> and on so many individual levels, yes. that's yes. all of our stories. When you think about what we keep, what becomes those sacred objects for us, becomes so much of a part of us in a sense. And you do have to be to find a space or to become still, to hear those voices, yeah. to hear someone say everything you need is, is right. You. And, and to be able to see it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To be able to have that requires security. Yes, a degree of security, even if that security isn't necessarily that I will have this dedicated house, this space, right. but that I have right. this security that all is well. Mm -hmm. All is well. Mm -hmm. And that is sort of the thing that, um, you know, you talk about ancestors. My grandmother uh, came to me in a dream two days ago. Oh, you're so lucky. <laughs> yes, the first time ever said, she used to say to me, well, you start, this, I can't do it without her voice. Well, you know, you start your blessing. You start with A and you go to Z. That's what you do. No matter what's going on, you start with A and you go to Z. And so just to be able to say, what am I grateful for? Oh my God, I have water. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I have this pen. Yes. Oh, look what I have here. I am so grateful for that. And if you, for me, if I could do that, then yes, yes, yes. it was security. Yes. But it wasn't the security that I counted no. on anyone else to provide yes, for me. Yes, I, I think and that, that security defined the way our culture right. frequently defines yes. it. Yeah. And, and the, what I'm speaking about is what can I do to create that bubble for you? What do I need to do as a society or a participant in society to ensure that you have the safety and security right. and stillness mm -hmm. that allows for that channeling and that remembrance and that medicine to come through and to be present and express? And that is the belonging piece that I'm, I'm speaking of that, that speaks to this land and the preservation and need to preserve this land mm -hmm. and in and, and other spaces similar to this or, or the absence of that security and how that, right. those, that power or those traditions have been forgotten as an act of erasure mm -hmm. because of that, the lack of that safe space and, mm -hmm. and protection. Um, and, and it and strikes me that, at least in this nation, this history has never for black people to create those safe, sacred spaces for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it is Tulsa, Oklahoma yes. as a safe space, or Brownsville, Brownsville South Atlanta, Brownsville, exactly. 1906. Right, and it almost becomes a radical act for blacks to yes. do that. Which kind of leads me to your title, mm -hmm. uh, Remembrance as Resistance. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how you came to that. Um, a lot of my work in public art is around gentrification, um, holding up black narratives in changing communities, uh, creating monuments and, uh, and placing iconography in communities to affect the ethics and culture of that community, um, you know, as others have, but our community lacking resources or opportunity or circumstances or erasure. 
have not had a chance to. So when I have a chance to do a public monument, it is black narratives in that community that upholds the history of that community so that those who've lived there and those legacy residents will be interested in remaining. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, all of that contributes to, um, his, my, I view historic preservation as ancestral veneration is an element as well. Um, and I'm trying, I went on a tangent, so I'm trying to find my way back. What, what was it that you asked? No, I asked where, how you came to the concept of oh. remembrance as Thank existence. you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Erasure, you see, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Uh, but remembrance as a resistance for me, when I saw the 800 tiny uh, flags over the hill of the African American burial grounds at Oakland Cemetery, mm -hmm. and thinking that an entire generation of ancestors were lost for their family members, that, um, that the act of remembering them was, re was an act of resistance against forgetting them and erasing them um, in our contemporary landscape and you know to acknowledge their erasure from before mm -hmm. especially in contemporary discourse around history being told and by whom and to whom mm -hmm. uh, making sure that those black narratives weren't lost in that discourse mm -hmm. uh, and so for me remembrance is resistance um, right. by and, and that includes historic preservation that includes ancestral veneration, that includes um, protecting and encouraging and creating safe space for black innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, very, very important. important. Yeah. Here forward. Natalie, what would you like for people who see your art to, I don't want to say take, imbibe, <laughs> ingest, I want people who see my art to see themselves, to see how beautiful and sacred and powerful we are. I want people who see our art to say on some level, oh, me too. Uh, I, I painted a child and it doesn't matter how many times someone said, that looks just like my grandchild. <laughs> <laughs> that, that looks like I, um, I, I, I use, my daughter's been my muse for many pieces and I want people to look at that and have their heart feel what amazing and beautiful people we are. Mm -hmm. That's what I want. And um, you know, there's narrative, there's story. So I love talking about the individual pieces and what came up. I use my family a lot in, in, in memory. I, I, I use old photos of my people a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but then I want you to think about your people. Yeah. I want you to uh, remember them. And I, I love when I heard you talking about praise houses and spaces, I thought how wonderful, how wonderful that is. Mm -hmm. And so my way is simply is to tell the story. I will tell the story and I will tell the story mm -hmm. and I will say go home and tell the story. Go home and ask someone for a story mm -hmm. um, because that's a way to remember. But that's the physical spaces that you're talking about creating just fill my heart to think of those spaces. I mean, it's one of the reasons I like to come here mm -hmm. to say, you know, it was a <laughs> this floor, this floor. Right here. Mm -hmm. a, a relative of my husband helped build this building right here. And so, you know, yeah. it's here when I walk, when I go down to the King Cottage. Right. That here, that, that church that was built, you know, and, and, and to stood there and to walk through that door, these things, these, they mean something. Yes. And to preserve them means something. And I don't think, I personally, I never see myself as having the power to preserve the space. Mm -hmm. But I can preserve the energy of yes. the memory and of the, memory the thing. Of it. Yes. Um, and so that's what I do, and I do it with my visual art as well, if that answers that question. Yeah, that <laughs> okay. that Beautifully. All right. um, as you were speaking earlier, I just remembered, uh, I grew up in Harlem, New York, and one just of my there. memories, mm -hmm. Saturday mornings, were the trucks that came up from South Carolina, North Carolina, with collards, vegetables. And this was a time when there was no Whole Foods in Harlem. <laughs> and if you wanted to get produce that was healthy, my mother and I would have to go on a bus, go downtown, buy, come back uptown. So those farmers who made that 12-hour trip were our lifeline yeah. to healthy living. I kind of feel it was that presence. I was the one sent down the four flights to go by the college, go by everything, and bring them back upstairs. And when I come down here, 
that's what comes back to me, <laughs> interestingly <laughs> enough. It's like a whole conglomeration of different memories, feelings, but this does not feel different to me at all. No, no. I'm working on a book, it's my first one, um, with McMillan, and it's a children's book, and it's called Okra Stoop. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's about, uh, it, it, the story is a little boy and his father who go out in the garden and they pick all the things that they grew. Mm -hmm. And their father sits, the grandpa sits on the porch and he sows sweet grass. And they go out to the water and they cast the net and they bring in the shrimp. And then they use the great grandma's cast iron pan for the Ooh, cornbread. Yes, yes, and they yes. use Nana's bowl for the mix. Okay. And they put it all together. <laughs> and I was trying to explain to the editors, you have to understand, each of those things is a character. They are a talisman. This is a Sankofa yes, book. Yes, yes. And so I put the symbol of Sankofa all the way through it because yes. I want you should know that that looking is a sacred back to act. See forward. Looking back to see forward. Yes. yes. That if you remember the collard greens that they grew, yes. if you have your great grandma's cast iron skillet, yes. which I do, yes. as do yes. I, yes. 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 you are holding and my sacred. Bowl. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. You have sacred talismans. They are yes. no less sacred. Yes. Right. Encoded within our, yes, yes. Encoded, with, encoded within our cultural yes, DNA. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Awakening in us like symbols in a freedom quilt. Absolutely. And right. I have my grandma's Pointing, quilt. Right? Right. <laughs> Pointing our way home. Absolutely. They, it, those cultural, uh, in, that cultural encoding wasn't only just in freedom quilts. It was literally in how we sit, how we stand, how we eat, how we dance, how mm -hmm. we season our food, yep. how we grow trees that are collard greens. You know, <laughs> all of the rice. Yeah. Rice is yeah. a wonderful example. And the rice grew, I live in Georgetown, which was the center area. of rice mm -hmm. production in, yes. in the country. In, in the Gambia. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, in all these areas. Uh, I start using rice in my art. It's that's how it I just glued it all over the page. Yes. One of them is rice. All of that is, it remains encoded yeah. in us. That's where it comes from. On our DNA. I had an elementary yes. school teacher Mm -hmm. who was from South Carolina, and I remember one of the first projects she had us do was make art out of rice, rice and beans. Which rice I, and beans, yeah. It was perfect, perfect. A meal and a yes, palette. And a, yeah. and a palette, <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Remembering those. Well, let me ask you the same question. Mm -hmm. What do you hope people feel, take away when they see your work? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for asking that. Um, okay, I want people to feel the prayers and assurance of their grand grandmothers, mm -hmm. of their grandmothers. And their grandmothers to the beginning of time, without interruption, mm -hmm. that same prayer that pushed through time, I want that feeling to come over someone yeah. when they see my work. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that prayer give comfort and encouragement. Um, I just painted seven paintings of prayers that our grandmothers would pass on to mm. us. And they are, you know, what I want to see in what is ahead, what is the future for, for humanity. Uh, so I call it a creation story. Oh. And, I, and I imagine that that was the conjuring element of the, of the ring shout. Mm -hmm. That there was, a, there was a power in the collective gathering and intention of a community that that towards freedom towards liberation you know so that same conjuring is what i uh, hope to inspire and i love forward. that word conjuring mm -hmm. right forward. part of those traditions that we have that's in our dna that mm -hmm. we don't even necessarily know is still right. there is there natalie did you want to add something? no 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 i was just i'm just thinking about your word conjuring as you well have to collaborate you know you're not yes and also you're gonna have to find a song yes a song <laughs> Oh, let me see. Because I, I have don't, practice in here. My husband okay, and I used you to have practice. to go first. Because no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> my husband and I used to practice with my cousin. We had a little trio before we got married. And we were in here once, baritone, tenor, alto. We're oh. singing. And then it's like there was a soprano, but there were just the three of us. Mm. And we're like, where's the soprano coming from? But we heard it here in this room. Mm. As you say that, you can hear her. <laughs> Can't you hear her? Yeah, we were. She's just like, high in the echo. Yeah, we stopped. We're like, you hear? Yeah. So you pick yes, one. You hear it? Yeah. Yes. You pick soprano. one. I and I'll find alone. my way. Well, now, okay. So, I was raised in the Midwest. All right. And um, oh, see, this is put the connections to the battle. Yes, I was. I was raised in the Midwest. Midwest uh -huh. and yes, still. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, mm -hmm. and beyond. Mm -hmm. I want to point out the story that you told about the farmers that made that twelve-hour trek. Mm -hmm. Griffin Lotson made that 12-hour that trek driving 
from these parts to get to Harlem yep. just the other day for us to do a ring shout in the Apollo. Oh, wow. How cool is that? Yeah. Wow. What okay. a treasure. Another sacred space. What a Another treasure. Another sacred what space, treasure. yes. We did a ring shout in Harlem led by Griffin Lawson. What a, what a treasure we have in him. I, I hope that he, he appears. Um, but I, I'm mentioning that because the migration of us. I grew up in the Midwest. Um, how are we shouting in the Midwest? My uncle, my great grandmother's brother was a traveling preacher and had their census that shows he came, to, you know, was in the South and Georgia areas and things. And he played a guitar. Um, and I grew up many generations later, moved back to the South, coming to churches in these areas. Didn't know I was jamming in a praise house. <laughs> like rocking hard, like whoo! The instrumentality, the musicianship. Mm -hmm. That happened to me once and I just wept. Because <laughs> the feeling was so what? immense. Yes. And I know I was not just yes, weeping yes, for yes. myself. I felt that yes, the black many house. people were present there. Come on, yes, yeah, from, from that now. place, from that place. And when you come to the praise house later on, you, you all must. Present. After we dine and the sun sets, we'll make our way. We're going to the Chapel of Ease, and we're reclaiming that space in a particular way. Uh, my work uh, is informed by my you know, history and time in the Gambia, too. And I'm excited to point out the, the crushed oyster shells um, that are inside of that architecture. So you know, the, the, we're, going to, we're going to have all of this. Uh, tonight, let's go. Yeah. You're gonna experience. But what song? I'm giving y'all excuses. I'm I'm stalling <laughs> because I'm from the Midwest. But it all comes okay. from the same place. It all comes from my the same mama's place. favorite song. So okay. old spiritual. Ron's mama. Old spiritual. Okay. You might not okay. know I it. I got one. But it comes I got in. One. Okay. 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 Will I come this far? I find no fault. I feel like journey on. Yes. Come this far. Uh. I find no fault, and you gotta give it. I feel like journey on. Well, I come this far. I find no fault. I feel like journey on. I come this far. I find no fault. I feel like journey on. You know. Sometimes down, so I feel like journey on. Sometimes most level to the ground. Feel like journey on. Well, I have come this far. I find no fault. I feel like journey. Almost 102 inches. That's what we wanted in the room. Yeah, that's what we wanted in the room. All right. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Now I could do this all evening. Okay. So I think it's okay. I thought you. I thought you were gonna say you had a song. Oh no. no. Okay. You wouldn't want that. Believe me. <laughs> I heard that baritone. I heard the baritone. I heard the baritone. Did you get a baritone? I heard it. Yeah. I was like, oh, cool, cool. Okay. <laughs> well, we'd like to hear from those of you who have come out this evening. Questions, comments, thoughts. Don't be shy. You knew this was coming. Who's from here? I want to know who's from here. Yes. I have a question. Bring yes. someone well. For either of y'all, do you feel like the younger versions of you are astounded by, by who you are today? And in your remembering of like all that comes before, does this include the remembering of the versions of you that come before? Do you think about how the younger versions of you think about who you are? Or do you think about the younger versions? That's from, that's from your daughter, so I'm going to let you go first. <laughs> my daughter, oh, coming over here. Yeah, we're coming, I'm sorry. Over here. My daughter is a public historian, and one of the I things that, that she that does question. is she does research in my family, and she's, she's taught me stuff about my family I didn't know. Mm. Um, she's gone, Doug, I've called those people out in Alabama. I said, you did? I didn't even know we had anybody in Alabama. Um, wow, Sarah, Sarah McKeever. Um The younger me had no idea who I would grow up to be. 
Um, and part of me says, how could we? How could we right. possibly? You know, you, you grow up with, I grew up with the structure that was being placed upon us, particularly as a young black woman. I'm older than you in the 60s. And the thing was, I was, supposed, <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to be an exemplary black person so that I would uphold the race. And so you couldn't just be a little child. You had to be the child who was, didn't, who held up the family, don't, 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 don't shame us, mm -hmm. and held up the race. Mm -hmm. And when I went to, I integrated four schools, and in the North, like, the folk don't think we're doing that, but we are. We yes. are, yes. yes. The only yes. little black girl going yes. into the space, there is no National Guard. Right? Yes. yes, It's just you. Mm -hmm. And so you learn to fit. Mm -hmm. You learn to be accommodating. You learn to be agreeable. And you learn to be, you learn to be non-threatening. My grandmother used to call it, you make yourself smaller. Mm. I didn't know that that's what was happening. Yeah. And my mother would say, when the children would say, go back to Africa, and I'd say, but I'm from Rochester. Um, she would say, well, they just don't know. Mm -hmm. They're just ignorant and they don't know. So my job was to be the exemplary little black girl mm. who got straight A's. Mm -hmm. And um, if they did, if they're doing an A and P anatomy and physiology and got an A, I'm doing it. <laughs> if they're doing calculus, I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this sounds very familiar. Yes. <laughs> And so that was it with the idea that in my child's mind, all they, all they needed to see was how wonderfully exemplary we could be. And then they'd go, oh, oh my goodness, racism, that was stupid. You know, <laughs> mm. it took me a long time to recognize that that was not going to do it. And to be the woman I am now who says, ah, I am an amazing and a wonderful and exemplary woman for my own self and for my ancestors, mm -hmm. is different. It's a different, yes. Mm -hmm. Is a different. It is not an attempt to earn the validation that as a child, mm -hmm. I thought I had That's to necessary. earn. Right, right. And now I'm sort of like, okay, y'all, this is it. Yes. And, um, you know, the, the exemplary code switching yes. of my childhood and my young adulthood, I have just let it go by the wayside. It feels mm -hmm. so wonderful oh my because God. my grandmama and my great grandmama and my mama and my daddy, they are proud of me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, right, yeah. Right. So, yeah, I look back. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful. I such a present think present. that is the huge like accomplishment that we get to. If we can realize everything that you have just said, I think life is our meaningful. Yeah, our, our, our grandparents are proud. Our ancestors yeah. are proud. Yeah. Right. We are living. We are living the freedom that, that they, they exactly. that they sacrificed exactly. for. Mm -hmm. You don't get away from that question. Oh, I was also interested <laughs> in hearing what your answer was, too. Oh. Yes, yes. Um, man, I have, I have a similar end, you mm -hmm. know, to my story. Um, I think, though, my grandmother was, you know, like over six feet tall. My mm -hmm. granddaddy, I thought, was like John Henry. I thought he really was John Henry. Like, they're talking about my granddaddy, you know. <laughs> uh, he was a coal miner. Mm -hmm. uh, my great-grandmother, his wife was 4'9", but he was 7'2". <laughs> you know, wow. so we were, we, and all of their children were large and tall. And but, So I, I, my earliest memories are of statuesque, powerful beings. And, my, and they were leaders in the community in terms of church and all of that. And um, I did some diversity. Um, um, work myself too in certain spaces in education. I went to Agnes Scott College, you know. So we were in a during um, the Rodney King riot mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. the end the of apartheid. First racial recognition. Yes, right? yes, the end of apartheid. And so we were we were activists. Uh, but I recognize that my activism came from my earlier years of 
of church, yeah. really. You know, the, the ethics were instilled in me by my great grandmother, my, my elders. Um, but my earlier self, It's so funny because I don't think I would have, mm -mm. <laughs> especially because I was rebellious. And now I'm only remembering every mm -hmm. single thing and person, element, and fiber of me is probably my grandmother, Ivani Braster, you yeah. know, so is remembering myself. And I'm doing that in real time as I'm also showing my children how to do the same. Yeah. Right. And I'm remembering myself and in that's them. That's a great gift. And yes. I'm remembering myself in them. I'm like, okay, you, oh, you, we about to hula hoop. See, this is how you hula hoop. So I got to remind myself, you know, of my, of my, myself, in, yeah. in order to make that for them. So I guess in the end, you know, I, I was, I'm, where I'm at now, it feels so familiar. Mm -hmm. It feels so like, of course, I always. It's kind of like it's exactly. Full circle, right? This is yeah. like yeah, full circle. Mm -hmm. and, and what you what we discover constantly in that state of yeah. of being and rediscovering and being finally truly who you are, who mm -hmm. always have always been. It is that that oh, of course, oh. element <laughs> constantly, perpetually. That that's just reminding myself of who I am. Mm -hmm. And and once I do that, I, and I look at that, I look at community and society and history that way and see that same power in doing that at mm -hmm. all of those levels, then it does restore things. It restore does restore. correct things. It does do the prayer mm -hmm. and the work that we are inside of. Mm -hmm. you know? my, so, my daddy uh, was a photographer of, of his, for himself and he took it for years and years and just recently we had these slides, some of these slides go back 50, 60 years and um, longer than that. And I see little girl me before they tamed me. <laughs> and I go, that's, and that's, that's what I said. Right. there I am, before they tamed me. And they tried, man. The patent leather shoes this way, that way, hair standing straight up on my head. And I'm like, oh, yeah. there I am. That's a treasure. Yeah. We are now. Yeah. We are now. Yeah. Sarah, that was a great question. What a great Thank question. Thank you so much. <laughs> great. Are there other questions or thoughts? Yes. 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 Where where was home? That's what I was looking for. I was looking for who's, who's from here. Yes. Yes. yes, you were ready for the world. I mean, the legacy of Penn Center to prepare our families and our, you know, its members, its students, its community for the world came. We were preserving our skills, and our, our trade skills, and our customs in the education that happened here. And that permeated as an example for liberation worldwide. It really did affect all of us everywhere, mm -hmm. what happened here in this right. sacred space. Right. I try and get my students to understand that. I call Thank it you. the black example, in a sense, because that is yes. exactly what is happening. It's been an inspiration right. yes. worldwide. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. Yeah, it thank is. you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I have a question. How do you Can you speak up just a when I hear you talk about sacred spaces, how would you incorporate that in the mindfulness? Because um, a lot of individuals don't have our same experience and, and can't feel that that sacred space is there. How would you, um, when you can bring that along with you when you're talking about mindfulness? I, that, I do a lot of, that is a lot of how I create sacred space, is the mindfulness, that the sacred space is within us. And if it, was, if, if it is within us, it is everywhere. They, as the song goes, this joy I have, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away, that it's here. And so when I, for example, I said I had those 40 days of sacred practice, I would just say, first, first there's gratitude, and there's recognition, and there's presence. And to sit quietly with that, 
to sit quietly with that, to do that every day as your practice. Um, and if you know who your ancestors are, mm -hmm. call their name. On my desk, because my daughter gave it to me, is a picture of my grandmother on my 40th birthday reaching out for a hug like she did in the dream oh, the other awesome. night. Wow. Oh. And so to call their name, I have a journal. Every morning I write and then I start the gratitudes because grandma told me to do that. I start with whatever I got. Yes. When I got back from Sierra Leone, I said, Craze, thank you for flush toilets. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Actually, every morning. Every morning. Every morning. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you for fresh water. Yes. yes. Thank you for the memories. Thank you for what you taught me. Thank you for the collard greens in my freezer. Mm -hmm. And I'm creating sacred space that I carry with me. Um, this joy that I have. The world didn't give it to me, mm -hmm. right. and the world didn't give it, and you know the song, the world can't take it away. To be that mindful, and it seems so simple when the problem seems so big, but if we don't have the sacred space within ourselves, we can't create anything out here. You know, we have nothing to build with. Mm -hmm. What are we building with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, I think, is another gift that we've been given, a way of mm -hmm. understanding and seeing the world differently. Yeah. while you're in this, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that is the ring shout for me. Yeah. Mm. That's the ring shout. Mm. We created sacred spaces where we came and gathered mm -hmm. and harmonized. At and in great cost sometimes. Yes, in, great, in, yeah. in secret, secret spaces sometimes we had, mm -hmm. to, we had to do. Uh, and we were preserving our African identity in those acts and those rituals and those prayers um, with intention. I'm thinking about secret because you're talking about the spaces that you're creating and I think that's really amazing and wonderful. And there's always the part of me that thinks about, you know, the fact that they went off and they were in secret mm -hmm. because, you know, you couldn't destroy what you couldn't find. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm thinking about that as you talk about the secret thing, the sacred spaces that yeah. we're creating. Yeah. And I'm not sure what I'm feeling, but I just want to ask you about that, about mm -hmm. the, the public sacred spaces that we create for us to know. Mm -hmm. But tell me where you think, if, if you think quietness has anything to do with that. And I don't know if that's just me thinking about they can't destroy what they can't find. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. But I don't know if that's just my own sort of self-protective, you know, like, because mm -hmm. the sacred space in me is mine. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Alice Walker once told me that unless she gets to that stillness, mm -hmm. nothing is going to happen. Unless she gets to the point where she can hear and feel those voices and those presences, nothing is going to be written, created, or anything. So I think that stillness is very yes, important. Yes. And I think it's important to share mm -hmm. that medicine yeah. with others. But also, I feel like, is it me? But I feel like it's encoded and, and, and yes. um, protected mm -hmm. for, from and only for those who know. Okay. No. Uh, those, those, who, uh, that, those who see, <laughs> those so who hear, friend, hear. A yeah. friend of mine and I went to see Indigo Prayers. Mm -hmm. We're standing looking at the same panel, reading completely different things. They're mm -hmm. complementary things, mm -hmm. but they're completely different coming from the language of the codes that we know. So yes. I'm convinced yes. that when these things are placed, yes. we can we know. read yes. them. Yes. So yes. We understand things that I think other viewers don't because we're just bringing different languages. Yes, we've got the key. This. We've got, got the key with, with us. Right. Yes, yes, right. yes. And, and even even those of us who have the key, we for for us to even understand or to be, you know, in that in that moment of intention and sacred space, we we would have had to condition and be ready within our mm -hmm. bodies mm -hmm. to arrive to that, mm -hmm. to hear that. So it calls that medicine forward or it calls that that healing forward and, and so the work that you're doing is helping to condition folk then to see and to hear your visual work and your physical body of work is in a way helping us be prepared to interact with it yeah, it, it, yeah. that and then when you see it it is prayer yeah. that the work itself is prayer the image that you're looking at has a name that's based on the prayer that it's in invoking mm -hmm. and the body of work and an installation of it is the the, the, the ritual 
Mm -hmm. just like the ring shout was. So you are inside of an actual prayer. And so you use you that word say. ritual. Mm -hmm. And so when you talked, asked about mindfulness, mm -hmm. I think when I, when I do it, it's about creating a ritual. And for me, the ritual is the gratitude, the journal, the candle, the prayer, the acknowledgement. But ritual is crucial. Yeah, and ours was the yeah. stomping, the standing in circle, yeah. the call and response, the, the gathering itself, the, sec yeah. the sacred uh, and secret locations. All right. of that was, was ritual that came out of West Africa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's about you, in, the, in that moment of remembering, you mm -hmm. know, remembering where you came from, you know, yeah. the ritual yeah. is present. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Is that perfect? Oh, that's perfect. That's the idea that we carry certain codes in ourselves that come from sacred spaces. It is something that I think that for me, my grandmother immigrated from Ireland. Okay. If you can come in this way. Um, I uh, was raised Pentecostal, and uh, <laughs> yeah, we would we would come to these parts to revivals in these areas, and um, the my upbringing um, led to my interest in African traditions because I was wanting to know where the Holy Ghost comes from. <laughs> and uh, the possession mm -hmm. of, um, of the shout. And uh, I learned of the ring shout and use it in my work as a, um, a bridging point between the past and the present. And um, so then I've been studying uh, indigenous traditions out of West Africa uh, Nigeria, um, and histories mostly out of Ghana and the Gambia and Senegal. Um, and my historical uh, research has led to amazing times with uh, national griots that are there in the Gambia um, that have recorded um, oral histories since the 1960s and they advised Alex Haley when they made the book he, he discovered the story of Roots and Kunta Kente. That same historian is who advised my work and mentions of even um, how during uh, earlier history in that, those parts during Stonehenge, you know, uh, not Stonehenge, it's Stone Circle is what it's called. In, in the Gambia it's called Stone Circle. Um, there were traditions of gathering and circle and calling response and similar. And, then, and that expresses freely in contemporary African, West African culture today, especially um, uh, in, in Islam. You know, there, there, there's a whole sect called Bifal out of Senegal who keep um, a, a call and response, 
parading tradition element to their even their Islam, uh, their, their study of Islam, and uh, and have up, upheld the African identity within. So I, I anchor a lot of my work on just finding those connecting dots from the past all the way, from the present all the way as far back as I can to the past. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting that you um, conceive of the ring shout as the vehicle that can kind of take you there. Griffin, I hear you know a little <laughs> bit about the ring, the ring shout. shout. <laughs> and I'm wondering, how do you understand it in relation to sacred spaces and all of the things that we've been talking about this afternoon? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that one. Actually, we had a, uh, a, a sneak peek, not a cheat sheet. I'm not going to call it that from the New York convention that we're talking about the healing and the right. shop, which was phenomenal. Well, I'm a seventh generation. I can trace by recordings, by books, and my own ancestry. Uh, so I'm kind of a geek when it comes to the ring shop. I, I, one of my biggest opportunities, I would have done it for free, but they paid me a lot of money. <laughs> Even uh, better. <laughs> yeah, the movie Roots uh, that, that just came out in 2016. And we did the work for them, and I never shall forget, I was in a setting similar to this, a lot more people was in there. The producer that had uh, directed Angela Jolie and Salt, and uh, Denzel Washington, and uh, Bones, and movies like that, had literally called me and wanted to know would I work with their production. And as the keepers of the cultures, I know all of these individuals, we walked the same soil in, in West Africa not too uh, long ago, Charmaine, I remember when she was not famous, okay? Now, <laughs> famous? Now she is famous. So I say That's that on a serious right note when he called, one of the first things I said to them is that if you're going to do the ring shot, there's two things that uh, you must do. Right? I am actually telling this Australian director that's filthy rich and famous uh, <laughs> what you must do. And somebody said, how could you do that? First of all, it was the polyrhythmic beat, mm -hmm. and then the counterclockwise. Mm -hmm. uh, the songs, that. we are the one that wrote those songs on the plantation, not the buckras. We wrote those songs. Mm -hmm. I know you all have explained the buckra thing. If not, you all explain it later. <laughs> so having said that to me, I said, well, they're probably going to fire me before they hire me. And I said, you must do these things. And to my surprise, uh, they still hired me. <laughs> then, and I'll close with this to show you how dear it is to our hearts, and, and I can elaborate more later. Uh, my grandfather, I saw him shouting. He's born in 1894 on my mother's side, 1882. Uh, my grandfather on my uh, dad's side. So we got all of that history there. And I saw him shouting uh, Pentecostal. Um, I'm a third generation Pentecostal myself, uh, born into the culture of Gullah Geechee. So I didn't get it secondhand, I was second and I was birthed into it. Mm -hmm. So and I saw him shouting. That was my first experience back in the 60s. And I wasn't a baby, so I'm kind of old, OK? Uh, your husband, Ron, I know how old he is, and I'm older than him, OK? <laughs> I'll leave that alone. Okay. So having said that, next biggest thing in that big production, uh, he hired a uh, history major of Africa, and we were skiking. And uh, they were in England, and here I am working on set in Louisiana, the same plantation that they did the movie Django, mm -hmm. was the same plantation I had to work on for him for this production. And she was telling them how the ring show, uh, how they dance and music in Africa. I didn't have any problem with that. So here's the producer here. She's skiking live from there. I'm here. I said, well, ma'am, I will not contradict what they do in Africa. I said, but I was hired to say how it was done on the plantation mm -hmm. in the 1700s, 1800s. So you may be right in Africa, but I'm here to tell the director what we do in America on the plantation. There again, I thought I was going to get fired. <laughs> and all the money he was paying her say, He's from Australia, so I had that accent. No, no, not you. We're going to do what you say do. We're going to do what you say do. <laughs> so we are keepers of that ring shot culture. We're mm -hmm. keepers of the Gullah Geechee culture. And we don't sell out, not even for money or fame. And that's what I like about who's on this stage. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. OK. We have time, I think, for about one more question. I know people would probably like to commute. Yes. 
I, it's funny because I, I, I don't use them in when I think about my work, and yet I think that my work is about justice in many ways because it's about telling the truth about who we are, acknowledging where we come from, what we bring, how we built everything that is here, mm -hmm. that our ancestors brought in their memory the foundations of the wealth of this nation, mm -hmm. the, the power that we have. And so there is no time that my work exists without that being a part of the story, if not in terms of direct narrative, in terms of what is included in this work. Mm -hmm. Who are these people? What have we done? I've been working with Rice in some of my work. And if I work with Rice, I say that we brought this wisdom and knowledge here with us and built the nation that we live in. And so for me, my work deals with justice in that it acknowledges who we are. Now, there are other ways that others of us work. And yeah. all of us don't do the same job. Very similar, though. Yes. Goal, but, the very similar. but my job is to always tell the truth. It may not look like someone else might think it would look. I had someone say, well, if you're doing these paintings of black people, how come I don't see you know, the blood and the struggle? And the... Because I'm bigger than all of that. That is not the limit of our story. So no, you don't see it there. What you see is our power and our beauty. And I think that, that, that adds to the story of justice, but that is how I do my work. And I know that there are others who are bringing their work to this table, so I'm a part of. It's the same. Yeah, I'm a part of a larger um, move toward justice. But I can only do what I can do, which is to tell the story either in a narrative way or with a painting. Tell the truth. When I see what you've done in terms of trying to preserve the ring shout, Griffin, I'm seeing those open layers of justice too, a concern with this form in this moment, connections to those larger questions of justice. Can you talk a little bit about that? Or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the first, I'll say 20, 25 years was a deep struggle and we started out with a mission. And the mission started well, from myself. And I use this phrase, it doesn't matter where I'm at, I get interviewed. You name any media it is, all of us have. From BBC World News to New York Times, I always say the same thing. And that's when I was a child. They would say, boy, you're too kitschy. And I didn't understand it then. And then I started learning it as a teenager. And then in my 20s and my 30s and my 40s and my 50s and my 60s, I'm going to stop there, OK? <laughs> and uh, I did start trying not to be Galagichi. And then, when I became an adult, I started digging deep, as Charmaine has mentioned, and uh, Ms. Days has mentioned, wanting to know about me and my culture. Then I went, as we say in our culture, for a while. I went deep down the rabbit hole. So in order to get what we do to the next level mm -hmm. for where we are, we're on a certain platform. I mean, we're, we're we're at a certain platform, and we want to pass on. That's why I took the time out. God knows I did not want to be late here. But it went from a descendant uh, in transition to an ancestor. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, in one week time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That speaks residence to me, mm -hmm. OK? Because uh, I'm close not too far from their age, 10 years. So whatever I got to do if I get that long or one week. So to me. It's being able to do things to get my own culture involved and then to get the greater audience in 
in, in vibe. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and we've kind of mastered that, not just trying to satisfy the two or the three, mm -hmm. but to get calls from, Jesus Christ, I just got a call this week from the Bar Association. I really thought they were, you know, well, a lot of African Americans, you know, that want to learn, that do work for the patent office, do work for White House and things of that nature. And uh, uh, they, they entry fee for a conference like this is $5,000 per person. Mm -hmm. Now I smile and I exhale. That's one example up here. But my lower example is, I shouldn't say lower, a different, uh, I'm going to say difference. I was doing some consulting work for Sapelo Island. And I had, I wanted to get some young people involved because I'm getting older. And I hired this guy. They paid me money and I paid him. Greatest thing happened to me because his knowledge was greater than mine. I mean, let's, let's face it, I, I know Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Day's daughter, they're much smarter than us old folks. They do modern stuff, they are. Mm -hmm. And after I hired him, my chest went up. Just mm -hmm. as it did with this guy that called me this week, I felt that I accomplished my goal. Why? I hired him, was teaching him about the Gullagichis, the ring shot and everything. And as we were walking out of the building with his knowledge, I didn't know how to do graphics, he said, I think my grandmother is a Gullah Geechee. The audience, you may not understand what that meant. Mm -hmm. When I grew up, I was taught to deny my mm -hmm. own culture. Mm -hmm. This young man, for the first time, yes, yeah, proud and I felt like mm -hmm. my job was accomplished. Yeah. I hired him because he had knowledge, but I also was teaching him. So these folks that's doing these big work now, they're calling on us. Jesus Christ, you got New York City and they're calling on Charmaine down here in Georgia. And this funny <laughs> talking coming, y'all get you that day up in New York City. We have arrived to a point now that people need to know more about this culture and our children won't be like I was. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I want to I want to add to what Griffin is saying. We want that to lead to historic preservation, and which is something more than buildings. Yes, mm -hmm. that this land will never be in danger of anyone um, developing it. Um, that sovereignty of land and culture cultural heritage is preserved in these spaces. Um, burial grounds like the um, Southview Cemetery in Atlanta that is being run over is preserved. All of that takes funds and resources. And we want to swing the pendulum of power towards those who have uh, labored this land and we acknowledge those this land were taken from yeah. initially. Um, and the generations that served these, these parts since. Um, and there, there's a way to do the math of the economic impact of that cultural content exported over generations around the world, for instance, from out of these parts and in, in these spaces but also the value of that intellectual property and those sacred spaces uh, in a way that continues to preserve and uphold the people that are descendants and families that remain and have lived and gone beyond these parts. There, they, we can measure these things. We can create models that, that sustain these spaces um, and not just hold good hard you know, mm -hmm. intentions, mm -hmm. but actually have policy and procedures and, and contributions and structures that have elements in them that allow for sustainability and reciprocity. That's a whole different vocabulary that's being brought to this idea of sacred space. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say just one point? So and that's, that's forever so, learned. Yeah, it's surprising, but I think each of us sometime rest at night now because we're finally being heard in, to a greater audience and the reciprocity and justice are coming through. It's gonna be 
probably a half a billion dollars sitting in that room. And I just smile because the keynote speaker is speaking on something they want to know more about. Little old sort of me talking to a half a billion dollars worth of lawyers and judges. They want to know about this culture. And we are smart enough to get in their head so maybe we can get some of those funds to help us do what we need to do mm -hmm. long after we're so gone. sustain mm -hmm. our institutions and our sustainability. Yes. Our institutions and our cultural heritage and our sacred spaces. Yeah. Griffin, Natalie, Charmaine, any final words that you'd like to share? Thoughts? It's an honor. Yeah. I've just been grateful to be here. Um, see, Griffin, get glad you made it. Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and to get to know yes. you, yes. I'm thrilled yes. about it. Um, honor. This honor. has been great. There is a word Myrtle would use. She said, not cultural present, but what was the word she used? Do you remember? Okay, there's a word that, that was about preservation, but it was about movement. Mm -hmm. Preservation mm -hmm. felt like it was stagnant, stagnant. Yes. Right. but it was about cultural, mm -hmm. to preserve mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. move forward. Mm -hmm. um, Sankofa, mm -hmm. in yes, a way. to look back to see forward. Yes. And so I, I just wanted, I couldn't think of the word. Uh, Myrtle Glasgow uh, was a brilliant scholar, and she and Sarah, she was a mentor for my daughter, mm -hmm. and she would just talk about that, don't, don't just preserve it. It must move, it must, it's alive. Mm -hmm. right. and, and it's continuing, it's evolving. It's evolving, Gullah culture as, Gullah language even as spoken 30 years ago isn't how the young folk are speaking Gullah today. Mm -hmm. But it's still there, it hasn't died, it hasn't gone anywhere, mm -hmm. it's evolving as it we evolve. Evolving. The mm -hmm. culture is evolving mm -hmm. with people like Sarah and the young people that you hired. Um, the work that Charmaine is Our doing. Well, yeah, I'm, so I'm excited. Not, you know, putting this under a bell jar so it can be looked at. You know, you yeah, know, no, you that's not what we want. Because sometimes when I'm in those rooms, really, sometimes I'm invited to be in those rooms and say, please, okay, y'all, <laughs> come to this island that we have now developed and we've scraped clean of any look of you, and please tell us about what we just erased, please. That would be lovely. <laughs> Thank you. It was beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that was beautiful. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, and that's not it. Right. right. That's not it. And I don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I said, don't ask me to come and tell you about what you just erased mm -hmm. because it made you feel good. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in, I'm a very nice person. Making you feel good is not why I'm here. Yeah. That's my younger self. <laughs> now I tell her, I don't do that anymore. Right, right. Don't do that. Right. Now I want you to feel, let's all feel good. Right. But uh, it's, that is not the end of what I do. Exactly. Yeah. And so, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you all so much for taking the can time I, to be I here. Oh, Describe I'm, I'm what's so going to happen later a little bit. Oh, okay. okay. Yes, no worries. Worries. I just wanted to say thank you and listen, because this is an opportunity that only us here will have, yes, right? Will. Okay. Yeah, please. We are um, going to dine together, break bread, I think. And mm -hmm. then uh, after, we're going to have a presentation at the Chapel of Ease. And at the Chapel of Ease, we're going to project an, um, onto the surface of the interior of the chapel. And I'm so excited because the interior projection of my praise house that I created at Oakland Cemetery is what we'll be using. And that footage was compiled from the ring shout as it's performed from Africa to Brazil to the Geechee Gullah ring shouters are actually a significant part of that image. And um, it also will be accompanied by a sound score that is amazing. Um, we, I, I say that because the artist who sings the song is not present, and I want to acknowledge her. Um, Malisha Jessie Taylor is an amazing vocalist um, from Atlanta. Um, she and her colleague, Salah Nansa recorded the sound score in First Congregational Church uh, in Atlanta Historic Black Church in downtown, Reconstruction Era Church. Um, and uh, the collage that you will see was created by Kimberly Benz, who is my visual arts collaborator, who came with me, and whose father and whose family are from these parts. And this is her first time here. So make sure you all greet and meet her. I am so looking forward to it. Yes, 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 she's here today, and she's now setting up at the Chapel of Ease. 
and Santiago Paramore, who does the sound installation. And while we had the, the mics <laughs> at this moment, I wanted to share with you all. I hope you will join us. And it starts at 8.30 when the sun sets. Okay. Please join me in thanking these amazing <laughs> <laughs>